welcome to the latest episode of Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I am Shriya and today we talk about a potential breakthrough that has come after the Venezuelan government and the opposition resumed talks. There are demands for an increased international mobilization to free Julian Assange and finally, tensions are brewing again on the Korean Peninsula as South Korea warns of action with allies against North. The socialist government of Venezuela headed by President Nicolas Maduro and the platform of right-wing opposition resumed dialogue on November 25th and signed a partial agreement. The move can lead the way to the recovery of Venezuela's assets worth billions frozen abroad due to US-imposed sanctions and is key to addressing the needs of the Venezuelan people suffering from a long economic crisis in the country. Prashant from People's Dispatch joins us in studio on this issue. Hi Prashant, so uh, what is happening with these talks? Can you give us a background and why is the negotiation important? Right, so uh, it's a very unusual set of talks because, uh, you know, uh, Venezuela has been under US sanctions for quite a long time in various ways, but these sanctions have peaked after 2019 when Juan Guaido, who was just a member of the legislature, declared himself the president of the country and was promptly recognized by uh, the United States and a lot of his ally its allies as the legitimate president. Now, Guaido's claim was that you know, the elections were rigged, etc., etc., which uh, there's been no proof of that. In fact, data suggests that Venezuelan elections are more fairer than in most other countries because of the number of procedures and safeguards that are there. But the point remains that Guaido declared himself the president and so ever since the US and its allies have supported him and imposed more and more sanctions on Venezuela, really squeezing the people in various ways. Now, there is data which shows that tens of thousands of people have died due to the impact of these sanctions alone. And the Venezuelan government, uh, you know, has really struggled to sort of control the country because of these sanctions, the impact it has had. And uh, But what has happened over time is that, on the one hand, the government has been able to sort of consolidate its strength, its control with the support of the people, the trade unions, the supporters of the Bolivarian revolution. On the other hand, the opposition has lost more and more of its credibility. And so have the US and its allies, which have been supporting this opposition. So... Uh, over time, there was a move uh, to sort of have negotiations, which both sides were interested in, because for, for different reasons, of course, because the Venezuelan government wanted to further consolidate, it wanted to relieve the sanctions, and as far as the opposition was concerned, it wanted to somehow reassert itself back into the uh, political space, so to speak. So that is the context in which some of these talks took place, and the opposition also, of course, having the backing of the Western powers. Mm. So last year, that's in 2021, in August, there were in September, there were two rounds of talks. The talks were suspended in October after the United States abducted, they pretty much abducted one of, one of the Venezuelan diplomats who is now in being held, uh, you know, who is now being held in the United States in detention after that President Maduro broke off those talks. But they once again resumed in March after the United States sort of realized, after it began, after the Ukraine war began and its uh, sanctions on Russia started backfiring, the US started to feel the need to somehow tap into Venezuela's uh, resources, especially oil. So uh, that gave the US an incentive to sort of push further for talks and therefore there, there was an opportunity, the Venezuelan government, like I said, looking at this as, as a chance to sort of, uh, you know, uh, recover from those sanctions, like you said, billions of dollars, uh, you know, outside have been frozen, have been seized by various countries. Now, for instance, the amount currently being discussed after the agreement you mentioned is around $3 billion. These $3 billion will be directed through a fund to healthcare, to food, to very education, to basic necessities such as this. And we need to understand that over the years, uh, Venezuela's economy has been wrecked because of the impact of these sanctions. So this is a big step. The other important step, of course, is that Chevron will be allowed to sort of ramp up production in its plant in Venezuela. Of course, the money will go to paying back debt back to Chevron rather than to the state-owned Venezuelan entity. But nonetheless, this marks uh, one positive step as well. And Prashant, you mentioned these talks are unusual, unusual and in terms of politics, what can the future of the country look like? Yeah, so it's, I think, very important to also once again go into why it's unusual because the Venezuelan government, uh, unfortunately, it's basically like if someone uh, decided to, uh, some great global power decided to recognize Donald Trump and all US assets in, in various parts of the world Trump could exercise control of. So it's that, if it sounds absurd, that is what exactly happened in Venezuela. Juan Guaido was allowed to actually control, uh, you know, various Venezuelan assets in various parts of the world. Or at least he could make him try to make moves towards that, which were blocked in various cases or stopped. So the Venezuelan government, unfortunately, having to face this assault on its sovereignty, on the sovereignty of the Venezuelan people, and has sort of, uh, you know, but uh, what has happened over time is also that 
the Venezuelan government, the Bolivarian revolution, it has actually regained some more of its, you know, its credibility has increased, it has regained some of its strength. Mm -hmm. Some of it is due to the fact that economic factors have uh, improved considerably. Some of it is due to the fact that, you know, the opposition's credibility, like I said, has come down. So we have seen consecutive electoral victories by the ruling, uh, by the ruling party in Venezuela as well. So uh, what these talks could lead to is maybe some more consolidation ahead of the elections, the fact that you know, the, the entire political spectrum might take part in the elections that are coming. It might lead to the possibility of, you know, some some more easing of sanctions as well, which is very important. And I think uh, the election, elections part is especially important because once the entire political spectrum is taking part in these elections, the government seems confident at least that, you know, uh, that they will continue to perform well because of the nature of the, because of the kind of policies they've been performing. But the important thing is that it will definitely help bust this narrative that the elections of 2018 in which Nicolas Maduro came to power were fraudulent because that has been the single plank on which Juan Guaido has carried out his campaign, on which there has been this vast-scale verification of Venezuela. Another important thing to note, of course, is the fact that the regional dynamics have also changed. We know that across Latin America, new wave of left-wing progressive governments have come to power. Many of these are far more sympathetic to Venezuela than their right-wing predecessors. We know that Venezuela and Colombia, for instance, have resumed uh, negotiations, uh, you know, and not only negotiations, they resume very strong bilateral ties. And this itself is a big step. So all this put together, the global scenario has changed, the domestic scenario has changed since 2018-19, when Guaido started making these uh, maneuvers. So I think it's a very different Venezuela that we're seeing today, and I think the government is trying to capitalize on that to, you know, bring more political and economic stability into the country. And as for the opposition forces, they also sort of realize that this is their best bet to, uh, you know, to keep staying, to, to stay within the system because they lost a lot of credibility over the past few years as well. So I think both sides are looking at this, the United States and other countries, of course, looking, they have their own Western interests in terms of energy, in terms of, you know, even regional dynamics. So all, each, all, all players having, you know, their own interests as is to be expected in diplomacy. Now the question is whether these talks can continue uh, in exactly this mode, if it can lead to more positive results, more agreements, which will actually benefit the Venezuelan people, which will lead to more resources coming back to Venezuela. Or if some kind of stunt will be pulled off, like what happened with Alex Saab last year, which again breaks the trusts and leads to, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, more chaos as well. So I think that's a key question. Thank you, Prashant. We'll keep following that. Efforts to intensify the demand to free Julian Assange are afoot. On Monday, November 28th, a group of mainstream media outlets released an open letter condemning the continued U.S. prosecution against Assange. It is also the 12th anniversary of the publication of the U.S. diplomatic cables leak, often known as the Cable Gate. The letter was jointly released by The Guardian, El Pais, Le Monde, Der Spiegel and The New York Times, who were the first to publish the leaked cables from WikiLeaks. The letter called the ongoing prosecution to be setting a dangerous precedent. Meanwhile, a delegation from WikiLeaks consisting of editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks and Joseph Farrell, journalist and WikiLeaks ambassador, is on a tour across Latin America to drum up support from various social movements and progressive governments in the region to call for Julian Assange's release. We go to Anish from People's Dispatch who has the latest on these developments. Hi Anish, glad to have you back for this episode. So this letter and the delegation are important moves. Uh, what can be said about these steps and what can they possibly amount to given the timing of the 12th anniversary? Yes, the 12th anniversary is definitely important considering the fact that in previous anniversaries we did not see much uh, forthcoming from mainstream publications, even those that actually published uh, a whole host of uh, WikiLe WikiLeaks uh, uh, journalist, uh, uh, you know, or re revelations that they actually brought up. Uh, and uh, despite that, uh, this this letter actually, the open letter that they are bringing out, also talks about the desperation of the times right now. Because uh, in many ways, uh, the if nothing is done, if there's no political intervention, uh, the the extradition to the United States uh, for Assange seems almost certain in many cases. Uh, even his team are not very hopeful of uh, the judicial process right now because at the end of the day, the decision was completely political. Now, uh, even in this situation, uh, if Assange uh, stands trial for you know, publishing the data that, he, uh, that was leaked to him and to WikiLeaks, 
then definitely that uh, opens up a Pandora's box uh, in the case of the Espionage Act uh, that can actually also implicate major news media houses in the United States and across the world, actually. And so definitely that is scaring a whole lot of uh, mainstream media corporations because they were also publishers. They were not just bystanders. And they were also publishing parts uh, or entirety of the documents uh, in many cases. So uh, these facts also uh, are important to consider uh, the kind of chilling effect that this prosecution already has on uh, press freedoms, not just in the US and the UK, but around the world. Because as we know, and we have talked about this repeatedly in the show, but I think like this point has to be reiterated as many times as possible. It's the fact that this prosecution is happening, this extradition process is happening, that a journalist, not uh, not a U.S. citizen, not a British citizen, an Australian journalist is being uh, held in jail uh, without any charge in the U.K. for more, nearly three years now. And uh, he's being extradited to the United States to stand for a very clearly political trial uh, raised by uh, a bellicose leader that could have been easily reversed under the current administration, but they chose not to shows the kind of seriousness that the U.S. is pursuing this case with, where they do not care about the implications that it will have on press freedoms at all. Anish, uh, it is interesting how this delegation is in Latin America and it's meeting all the top leaders there. Uh, what can be said about that? Well, as uh, Christian Fapterson talked about, he uh, this is definitely an outcome of recent political developments in the region where you had a wave of leftist governments being elected, even in places uh, where there could never have been a chance, or otherwise at least we thought there could have never have been a chance, maybe a year or two ago, uh, for any leftist president or a government to take power. But that happened. Uh, it obviously began uh, from Colombia. They are now in Brazil. After the 30th, uh, they, they are expected to meet other leaders and social movements so it is sort of uh, part of a larger campaign that is already happening. It's not something that just this delegation is doing. There is also there are also family members of Assange uh, who are actually canvassing for support in different parts of the world. They have been doing so for years now, and uh, this is just part of it. But to involve political leaders, uh, heads of government, heads of state. Uh, uh, as part of this campaign is important in the case that, in the sense that uh, it will actually put in international pressure on the United States to drop the prosecution, uh, which again, I mean, we need to reiterate that uh, it is based on very flimsy evidence, uh, problematic evidence, not just flimsy evidence, it's very problematic evidence. Uh, there are uh, a falsified testimony, at least, uh, we, are, we are very well aware of and the very fact that uh, over the past, the US, different US administrations have hounded Assange uh, and taken extreme measures towards that end. So this definitely is a problematic prosecution. And it's not just about free, uh, press freedoms. It's all, it also covers a whole host of other issues like national sovereignty and also war crimes and the, uh, you know, uh, you know, the responsibility of war crimes that US and its allies are refusing to take even to this day. So these factors definitely come in and obviously leftist, uh, the new leftist governments across Latin America who have all, uh, you know, have, who have a history of calling out uh, these, um, you know, these crimes that the United States has committed are definitely the best people to look for when trying to build international pressure. And so this is part of that. And uh, we can also expect uh, social movements, uh, journalist guilds and associations to also participate in these solidarity meetings. And so that will definitely also add to the kind of pressure that uh, Assange supporters, his colleagues, his family are trying to garner at this point in time. Thank you, Anish, for that. We'll come back to you for the next story. South Korea's president has warned of an unprecedented joint response with allies if North Korea goes ahead with the nuclear test. In an interview with Reuters, President Yoon called on China to help dissuade the North from pursuing banned development of nuclear weapons and missiles. Yoon also claimed that North Korea's actions were leading to increased defence-related spending in the region. What can be made of the latest spike in geopolitical tensions in the region? Anish joins us again for more. So, Anish... 
what are the implications of South Korea's threat? Well, uh, definitely it is targeted towards South Korea. It also, it marks a very sort of a, the nadir, like we, we keep talking about the nadir of, uh, uh, you know, South-North relations. But this is definitely a new low because we're talking about uh, very, you know, clear provocative statements being made by a South Korean president talking about uh, doing things that has never been seen before. Uh, very vague sort of threat, but definitely problematic considering the fact that, uh, you know, provocations are primarily the basis, the reason why these tests, these military drills, all of these things are happening. So there is no um, attempt at de-escalating the situation at this point. But the larger implication will also be uh, to check if uh, South Korea is taking a very clear anti-China stand. It's not very clear because definitely they are ta talking about China's responsibility, so-called responsibility in trying to, uh, you know, control or contain uh, North Korea uh, as a Security Council member, permanent uh, Security Council member. But, uh, you know, it is sort of, uh, you know, we need to read between the lines in some cases because uh, so South Korea has always been, even under Yoon, has been uh, quite cautious about the manner in which they approach China and the relationship because they're very well aware of uh, the kind, very well aware of the fact that China is their biggest trading partner. And also the fact that, uh, you know, being dragged into any kind of anti-China rhetoric can have uh, long-term implications that will not be good for South Korea. But, uh, you know, a statement like this, where they're trying to put responsibility or blame even on China at this point uh, is kind of concerning because if South Korea is an addition to this sort of anti-China encirclement in the region, uh, like it al always is because considering the fact that it is a very close US ally, but in a larger scheme of things, if there is like very clear provocations coming from South Korea, that can also have a bigger problem uh, in the future. But uh, because this is just an interview and, you know, he has made some, some statements about other things as well. Uh, we are not very sure if this is going to be an official government policy or if it's just the sort of, uh, you know, one-upmanship being uh, done by the president himself. Anish, can you also tell us a little bit about the state of things right now in the Korean Peninsula? Well, it is quite concerning because uh, we're already seeing this sort of uh, tripartite alliance kind of being built. Uh, with joint military drills between South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Uh, there is coordination in intelligence already that's been being declared. Uh, the South Korean government is trying to push for further arms deals, very uh, major arms deals. Uh, it has expanded the scope of uh, military drills uh, in the region, especially near the demilitarized zone, which is always, which has always been a bigger provocation uh, than any, uh, anything else in the past for tensions to rise and for any kind of nuclear test to come uh, to begin with. So these factors and the fact that uh, North Korea is also not letting down, uh, they are threatening uh, uh, another new, a seventh nuclear test, uh, is you know putting the region, because uh, we have to remember despite tensions and the fact that there are historical tensions uh, and conflicts in the region, the region has been the most peaceful uh, since the 1950s. And uh, if something of that sort is uh, disturbed at this point in time, when obviously we are looking at multiple players being involved, uh, this is not going to bode well for anybody because we're talking about different superpowers, economic superpowers or military superpowers being involved in the region, which is not just China, but also United States, Japan, and also South Korea, because it is a massive uh, manufacturing giant uh, in electronics and other, uh, you know, uh, sectors. So definitely uh, any kind of disruptions uh, because of a conflict is going to affect everybody around the world. Yeah. And so these factors need to be considered. Uh, we are not seeing any kind of, uh, you know, attempt to de-escalate the situation at this point by no parties. Uh, except for China. China is the only one that actually made statements uh, towards North Korea, asking them to work towards peace. 
while none of the other have actually done that and have only uh, you know given more provocations rather than any kind of even an attempt to come to a solution so this these factors are going to uh, become a bigger problem in the coming months uh, it is not a good time definitely for anybody watching the region thank you so much anish for joining us today and that's all we have for today for more such stories and updates from around the world please keep watching peoplesdispatch.org and also follow us on facebook instagram and twitter